Endurance Junkie Podcast, episode 100, brought to you by Health IQ, an insurance company that helps health-conscious people get special life insurance rates. Go to healthiq.com forward slash junkie to support the show and learn more. What's up? Thanks for joining me on this 100th episode of the Endurance Junkie Podcast, the show where I will be interviewing some of the fastest, smartest, and most inspiring people active in the endurance world today. But before we get going, I would quickly like to thank Health IQ for supporting. Many people in the endurance community have had trouble with how much they pay for their life insurance. And despite their own health conscious lifestyle, they might get penalized for family history and BMI and stuff like that. Well, Health IQ has decided to change all that, and they use science and data to secure lower rates on life insurance. Like saving money on your car insurance for being a good driver, Health IQ saves you money on your life insurance for living a healthy lifestyle. Now to see if you qualify and get a free code today, go to healthiq.com forward slash junkie, that's healthiq.com forward slash junkie, or mention the promo code junkie when you talk to a Health IQ agent on the phone. And maybe you can save over $1,000 on your yearly premium. Now, Kate Courtney is one of the top up-and-coming female cross-country mountain bike racers in the world. Sponsored by Specialized, Kate won the Under-23 World Cup Series in 2017, as well as the American National Championships in the Senior category. Now, this year she will be making her debut in the Elite category of the World Cup Series, and she has her sights set on Tokyo 2020. So hi Kate, thanks for uh, coming on the show today. Can you start off by telling us a bit about uh, yeah, yourself and, and your sporting background growing up and uh, how you ended up racing uh, mountain bikes? Yeah, hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Kate Courtney and I'm a professional mountain bike racer for the Specialized Factory team and for Red Bull. Um, actually, I started in cycling as a, as a young girl. I rode on the back of a tandem with my dad and it was our Sunday tradition, we'd go and get blueberry pancakes. So that's kind of what I thought mountain biking was um, until my freshman year in high school. I was definitely a competitive athlete. I ran, I was a horseback rider, kind of did every other sport possible, um, but never really thought of mountain biking as a competitive outlet. It was more just something I loved to do with my dad. Uh, until my freshman year of high school, I actually joined a high school mountain bike team uh, as part of the NorCal Cycling League. And did my first race in the spring and was hooked immediately. I think I loved both the competitive aspect of it, but I also was really drawn to the mountain bike community. It was something I could do with kids my age, with friends, um, and also something that I did a lot with my dad and continue to do with my dad uh, as I've gotten more serious and he's gotten back into it um, as well. So that's really how I got got started and was just hooked on racing immediately, joined a local development team and um, began racing for the U.S. national team while I was in high school. Uh, did a few of the Junior World Cups when that series was still around. Um, and then my freshman year of college signed my first pro contract with Specialized, where I've been ever since. Yeah. Okay, so you've been competitive pretty from, from the beginning. Um, where did that endurance base come from, do you think? Yeah, I think... I was a cross country runner, so that okay. definitely um, helped with endurance and you know learning to train and um, be able to kind of do that longer form cross country running training. Uh, I think also a lot of the other sports I did um, were really helpful in building overall strength and flexibility. I was a ski racer. Um, I played a little bit of soccer. I I did a lot of different things, and I think they all contributed to mountain biking in a different way. For example, I think skiing really has helped with my descending um, and obviously running helped with my endurance. So while I wasn't a competitive cyclist until I was in high school, which is actually a little bit later compared to a lot of my European competitors, mm -hmm. um, I think I was building a base and kind of building fitness in a lot of different ways. Yeah, okay. So yeah, so can you talk a bit about your progression then in, in mountain biking? Like, when did it become serious for you? When did you realize, okay, I, I'm I'm pretty good at this. I'm I'm pretty fast, and I can even make it to the to the elite level. 
Yeah, I think that's always kind of a a process. I think I'm focused on getting a little bit better every year. And, you know, honestly, last year was one of the first seasons that I really saw um, myself being competitive internationally at the elite level and realizing that that dream, you know, could really be a reality um, with some hard work and and a lot of uh, a lot of training this year. But in in high school, I saw it as something I love to do and um, started to see a few good international results in the junior category, which secured me an opportunity to compete for specialized, which was really a dream come true and um, exposed me to a lot of, you know, elite level racers. I was teammates with Leah Davison for four years on specialized. And that was a really great experience. And she really helped um, mentor me and show me that it was possible to be competitive internationally. I think also um, my U23 experience was really critical for me. I decided to stay in U23 all four years. Um, and I think the ability to just prov- like kind of get consistent results uh, was huge for me. So, you know, my first year U23, I was eighth in the World Cup overall. My second year, I was uh, fourth. My third year, I was second. And last year, I won the U overall. So I think um, when I won, people were you know, surprised and excited, which was a really incredible experience. But for me, it wasn't like an overnight, I just busted onto the scene kind of a victory. It was more of like a really slow, consistent progression. Um, And I think for me, that's even more exciting because it means that, you know, my layers and layers of training and hard work um, are really building on each other. And hopefully that's progress that I can sustain. Yeah. yeah, so it's definitely a case of yeah, a couple of years of really base building and, and building fitness on top of each other and then improving as you go along. Um, yeah, you always combine it as well with, with, with your studies. You just recently graduated from, from Stanford, I think, I mean, last summer. Um, yeah. So how, how was that to combine your studies with, with, uh, with your training and your racing? Yeah, it was, it was definitely a challenge. Uh, I think, you know, training takes a lot of time, but the bigger thing is that it takes a lot of energy and I actually work with a sports psychologist who always says it's not time management, it's energy management. So for me in college, it was, it was difficult to have enough time to train and get my schoolwork done, but it was also difficult just to have enough energy in the day. So not to be so wrecked from a workout that I couldn't make it to class or participate or finish my um, schoolwork. So it really was uh, a, a big balancing act and required some compromises on either side. Um, you know, sometimes an assignment wasn't done maybe in the exact way I wanted it to be, or I had to, uh, not do something I wanted to do to get extra sleep that night because I had a hard workout. So there was a lot of just kind of, you know, figuring it out as I went along and, and really trying to balance. Um, but I also do think that it was a really important phase and a really important stage in my career because, it did hold me back a little bit in a really positive way. Um, I love to train. I love to ride my bike. And I think if I had had full time to do that, I would have burned out or trained too hard. Uh, where school really gave me an excuse to take an extra rest day in a week or really look after my body. Um, and I think that's pretty key to consistency. Yeah, okay. So how's the, how did that switch go then? Because now you're a full-time athlete, um, no more school. Um, so have you been able to, to find that balance uh, as well? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I would say not being in school has been the biggest change uh, to my training in the, in the whole time that I've been cycling. So I can now train you know, two to three times harder than I was training in college, really. Uh, and that's primarily because of recovery. So it's not that I'm doing so, so much more on the bike. It's more that I can rest in between and come home and take a nap every day and, uh, make sure that I'm getting, you know, proper nutrition and, and really just be on top of everything. So I think it has made a big difference, um, and is coming up the perfect time as I gear up for elite. Yeah. Okay. So what do you think you, you need to work on to, um, to make that step from under 23s to, to elite and, and make it there to the top level as well? Yeah, it's, it's definitely an exciting year. Um, I'll be making the jump up to the elite world cups. So in the past, I've only raced elite in the U S at the pro CTs. It's definitely a big step, but I also think that, um, I'm, I'm ready to make the transition and 
it doesn't actually require a ton of um, change in my training regimen. I think I've definitely done more volume this year, up the hours, um, primarily as a result of having more recovery. But I really think it's more about consistency and continuing to, you know, put my best effort in and um, progress in the same way that I have in the past years. So I'm, I'm really trying not to do anything crazy or crazy different this year and uh, really just go with the program that has worked for me in the past. Okay. So is, is 2018 then really a crucial season for you or are you already f looking longer term and, and focusing on, on Tokyo 2020, for example? Yeah, I, Tokyo is definitely in the back of my mind um, and has been a part of all of our planning so far. But actually, interestingly enough, 2018 is a really good year for me to experiment and um, really get my roots in elite before I need to start worrying about Olympic qualification. So in some ways, uh, a lot of pressure has been put on me mostly by myself to you know, make that transition and really prove that I belong in the elite field. But on the other hand, it's also my first year and, you know, obviously not qualifying for the Olympics this year. So it's a little bit of kind of a flex period, um, which I think takes a little bit of that pressure off and is really going to allow me to just um, focus on what I need to do to be successful. Yeah, okay. Well, you've got a, a great team of coaches around you, I think. Um, how important is it to have these people around you there? Yeah, I'm a big believer that it takes a village, so... I have a lot of people in my village. I'm really fortunate um, to work with a great coach, a strength coach, a sports psychologist, a nutritionist, um, a really great PT. And also I live um, just about an hour away from my family um, and about an hour away from my mechanic. So <laughs> it's, it's really helpful for me to be surrounded by these people, not only because they give me great advice and are there to support me, but I think also um, they hold me accountable. So, you know, my nutritionist will check in on me, make sure that I'm doing all the things I need to be doing. And, uh, you know, as an athlete, it's, it's a full time around the year job. You always have to be on top of recovery and nutrition and all these things. So it's really helpful to have people supporting you in each aspect, um, of what it takes to be an athlete. So how do you go about then creating that year plan and, and your training plan and picking out the races that you want to do and do all these coaches, do they, do they work together in, in a way to, to, to develop that training plan for you? Yeah, I think they definitely communicate a lot. Um, the biggest, the biggest say in my training and race schedule is my main cycling coach. And, um, we kind of work together to set goals that work for me, work for my team and, um, you know, take into account the fact that I want to be racing. I want to be successful, but also, need to make sure I'm not traveling too much or that we, you know, get a rest weekend where we can, um, once the busy season starts up. So there is a lot of strategy and planning that goes into it. Um, and luckily now it's all sorted. So I just have to go do my job. Yeah. So it's going to be mainly, uh, yeah, the, 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 the cross country world cups that you'll be racing uh, next year. Yeah. Those are the main focus, um, as well as the world championships in cross country and actually i'll be doing the marathon world championships this year as well so it should be a an exciting and big year with lots of key events all right cool well, we'll look out and uh, hope you do well um yeah a concept that's, that's pretty big these days and i think it all started in cycling um but i think it's been more become more and more important in, in all different kinds of sports is uh, the aggregation of of uh, marginal gains um you know the belief that if you improve every area of, of your cycling in your case by just one percent you know that it ends up by um uh, getting giving you a, a remarkable improvement um is that something that you also use in in, in your training and your racing yeah i i really love that philosophy um i think it's really important especially in a sport like cycling where you know you know that everyone is out there training as hard as they can on their bike so you have to look for improvements elsewhere um, sometimes, you know, I take, I take my training on the bike as seriously as I possibly can and really maximize that. But a lot of times my ability to perform comes down to that nap that I took that extra, um, little protein meal that I had. Cause I knew I didn't meet my numbers for the day or, you know, those little kind of things that you do and pay attention to, um, that really help your body meet the requirements, uh, that you're 
that you're putting on it and kind of meet your training load and succeed um, through those big blocks. So I, I do think that kind of those little improvements are really important. And this year, now that I've had uh, some extra time without school mm -hmm. and a little more stability, I've really been focused on routines and um, thinking about, you know, daily rituals and things that I do every day that help my performance. Okay. Can you give some examples? Yeah, I think I actually just wrote a, a cycling tips article on this. Um, but, you know, one of them is meditation. So that was really hard for me to incorporate in the past. It's one of those things that you wake up and want to do and then, you know, procrastinate. One thing leads to another. It's the morning, you're busy, and um, it can kind of slip away from you. So I started doing a meditation immediately when I woke up in the morning and actually um, – putting my phone outside of the room where I sleep. And I think that little ritual uh, has actually made a huge difference because I, I don't look at my phone before I go to bed now. I don't look at it in the morning. I It's much easier for me to do my meditation when I don't you know, pick up my electronic and see all the messages I got and all the things that I need to do that morning. Um, and so it's, it's really changed the way I go about my day. And I think that's important to recovery. It's important to sleep. It's important to well-being. Um, and those, those little changes do, I think, add up to big improvements and to just feeling better on the bike. Yeah, okay. so how important is nutrition for you, for you guys? I mean, does the fact that you spend so many hours in the saddle give you like a free range to, to eat whatever you want or are you you're pretty strict in, in what you put in your body? Yeah, I, I would say yes and no. I think on, on really big training days, um, you do burn a lot of calories cycling. It's one of the... Uh, highest burning exercises you can do. So, you know, it is really important to refuel. And oftentimes that means I get to eat a lot, <laughs> but I also focus a lot on what I'm eating um, because it's, it's really important to put the right fuel in your body and, and to pay attention. I think when you, when you burn so many calories, it's easy to come home. And if you don't have a plan, you'll, you'll eat a bag of chips. Like yeah. I, we've all been there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you will eat the bag of chips and, and not get the fuel you need, but then kind of feel gross all day. So when I'm, you know, competing at this level, I just can't afford to do that anymore. Uh, so it's come home, have my recovery shake, do my stretching, eat the lunch that I know is kind of meets my nutritional needs and can also be very delicious. So I wouldn't say it's incredibly restricted, but I do pay a lot of attention to what goes in my body. Mm -hmm. We've had a question come through from uh, one of the listeners, uh, Maya. She she wanted to know what your uh, pre-race breakfast looked like. Ooh, that's a good one. My pre-race breakfast is actually my favorite meal. It's the most delicious thing I get to eat, um, which is a gluten-free waffle with banana and sometimes some Greek yogurt and maple syrup. Um, and then I also, I actually use Red Bull as my source of caffeine. Um, I don't really drink coffee outside of, uh, I, I don't drink, you know, other kind of caffeinated beverages for just daily life. Um, I try to kind of restrict caffeine to its use for performance. Um, and so having kind of a measurable amount of caffeine in the morning really has actually changed my pre-race routine a lot. So I know exactly how much is in an eight, eight ounce Red Bull and can, um, kind of match that with my food intake and, and know that I'm getting the same thing every time that I go out to do a really, really hard workout or go out to a race. Okay, cool. Well, I hope she, uh, she's happy with that answer. Um, yeah. What's, uh, what's the, the best, uh, advice that you've had to, uh, in, that you've received in the sport so far? Ooh, that's a really hard one. The best advice. I think the best advice has been to focus on the process, uh, and not the outcome. I think, you know, early in my racing career, I, I did focus a lot on results and I got a lot of satisfaction out of them, um, as I'm sure anyone who does a competitive sport knows. But at the end of the day, the goal is not to win the race. That's not something, I mean, well, that is a goal, but it's not something that you can focus on and 100% execute um, because it involves factors outside of your control. What if you get a flat? You know, what if someone else is really strong that day? Uh, whereas focusing on process and performance on, and on what you can do every day and in the moment in that race, um, really is what produces those results. So I think that's been kind of a subtle, but really, really critical 
shift in mindset for me, being able to stay in the moment, um, not think about the outcome and really just execute, uh, when I'm in racing and actually when I'm in training every day. Yeah. That's an advice that I hear quite a lot. So I think a lot of coaches have been giving sure. it and it definitely helps. Um, yeah, I mean, you've only been racing a couple of years, but, um, yeah. What do you see as your, your biggest achievement in your career so far? And what do you see as your biggest regret Ooh. or your biggest disappointment? Biggest. Okay. Biggest disappointment is a little bit easier. Than biggest okay. Achievement. Um, I'd say disappointment was, uh, last season I crashed in the first five seconds of the world championship race. So I had won the overall that year, uh, and was really hoping not, not just to, you know, win the race, but really to like have a really great performance and kind of be up there fighting for it. So I actually was able to salvage that event and I did get the silver medal, which was a really incredible result for me. And also, um, has proved to be very important for me, just knowing that you know, things can go wrong in a race and you can still perform and still overcome and do a really good job. Um, but I think it was disappointing not to have that kind of chance to fight for it, uh, from the beginning of that race. So that was, that was disappointing. I think biggest achievement, I think last year I was really proud to win the world cup overall. I think that the overall is a little bit undervalued in some ways because the world championships is such a big event and it is so much more prestigious, but I think the overall really attests to consistency. So to win the overall, you have to show up at six races that range from May to August, uh, and, and really be your best. And that's, uh, what I think, you know, kind of reflects the consistency and focusing on those 1% gains every single day and being kind of uncompromising in your preparation uh, it really shows in those overall results uh, because it means you showed up every time ready to do your best. Yeah, so it's be about being consistent. Yeah, well, the fact that you I mean you, you messed up that, that start at the World Cup and then at the World Championships and then ended up second as well, I mean, showed definitely some, some mental strength and definitely also uh, something to be proud of that you, you've been able to, uh, to fight there uh, during that race. Thank you. Yeah, it definitely, it was a good uh, good kind of, uh, indication that the mental prep I was doing last year worked really well and uh, prepared me to perform no matter what happened. Okay. Uh, what would constitute a perfect day for you? A perfect day. A perfect day would start with my waffle breakfast yeah, obviously. and then involve a very long bike ride and would end in tacos. <laughs> That's not really so healthy. It revolves around tacos. Tacos yeah. are... No, tacos are not unhealthy. Uh, okay. I would say. I mean, I I think it's actually a really good food for after a hard effort. Um, you know, tortillas, I'm gluten-free, so it's hard to get, you know, I don't I don't eat bread, so it's hard to get mm -hmm. carbs that are um healthy and good for right after a workout uh outside of just vegetables, which are also great and I eat a lot. But a taco is a corn tortilla, so that has, you know, some good carbs in it. Mm -hmm. Often it'll be a meat and you can have some veggies with it, put some avocado on top. You get your healthy fats. I think it's for me, actually, it's a great recovery food and it's also one of my favorite things. So that works. <laughs> okay. Well, one final one um, to finish it off. Okay. Uh, how do you define success and how do you measure up to your own definition? Ooh, that's another really hard one or just a really good one. Um, I think success for me uh, is just knowing that I gave my best effort. And I think that ranges from really, really small things like knowing that I, you know, got home from my ride and did my stretching, you know, did, did the things I was supposed to do kind of gave my best effort. Uh, but it also goes to the really big things, uh, like that world championship race where I crashed in the beginning. And, and I knew that given how that race played out, I did absolutely everything I could, um, mm -hmm. and gave my hundred percent best effort. And I think that's something that's hard to strive for oftentimes. Um, you know, sometimes you know you maybe could have tried harder or done better. Uh, but it's something that's really satisfying when you when you can do it. And it also doesn't rely on the people around you or the things around you um, going perfectly every time. It's, it's something that you can control. And then was it measuring up to my own yeah, yeah, definition? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I think 
that's, you know, a constant process for me of striving to do that best um, effort. And there are, you know, some races where maybe things don't come together or I have an off mental day and I don't feel like I gave my best, but it's really kind of keeping that in the front of my mind and, and really trying to push myself to, to achieve that kind of measure of success that really gets me excited to race and train every day. All right, cool. All right, well, thanks for that. Thanks for your wisdom. And uh, I hope, uh, yeah, I think we all got to know you a little bit. So uh, yeah, how can people get in touch with yeah. you if they want to? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, this was this was a really great chat. And if people want to get in touch with me, I think the easiest way is probably Instagram. Sad to say, but, <laughs> but yeah, I'm pretty responsive on there. Okay, cool. I'll put uh, that link up on the show notes pages. Um, yeah, feel free to give some love to your sponsors and, and your partners. Yeah, my okay. I'm like who? I'm like who are my sponsors? No, I'm. I have actually an amazing, amazing group of sponsors. Uh, Specialized Factory Racing is the team I race for, and I'm also supported by Red Bull, um, Oakley, Blue Lemon, uh, Rotor, Crank Brothers, um, and I'm a Cliff Ambassador. So, you know, all those all those partners really kind of come together to keep me on the best equipment and in the best shape possible for for race season. Not right, cool. Now I'll put those links up as well. Anything else you want Thank to plug? No, I think that's I think that's pretty pretty much everything. Okay. Well, one final one. Um, if you could sit on a bench uh, in a nice park and chat for an hour with somebody from the the past or the present, who would it be? Ooh, that's a, you're really you're really getting these good questions in there. <laughs> I think for me, you know, with the Winter Olympics coming up, I might say Lindsey Vaughn. I think she's someone that I have looked up to for a long time. She's also a Red Bull athlete and I have seen her a couple times in the Red Bull gym and she's just been a, a big inspiration of kind of perseverance and grit and determination. Um, and also just completely slaying it every time. So she's someone I'd love to, uh, to have a chat with. That would be cool. I'll take a recorder with you and make a podcast out of it. I think that would be a yeah, really, perfect. really good, that would be a really good chat. <laughs> We'll see. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Thanks for your time, Kate. Much appreciated. Thank you so much. Hi, Junkies. Thanks for listening to this uh, episode with Kate Courtney. Now, if you like these little interviews and don't want to miss any future ones, just uh, head over to iTunes or Stitcher and simply subscribe to the show. We'd also like to thank everyone who has left uh, a rating and a review there. It's much appreciated. And yeah, if you haven't done so yet, please consider leaving me one as it will uh, help grow the show. We're also on Spotify, so if that's your preferred medium, uh, just search for Endurance Junkie Podcast in the search bar and uh, you will find the show no problem. All right, thanks again for listening and I hope you'll join me next time. Cheers. Cheers.